John, you can take over from there. Um, okay, so uh, for our audience, uh, you can uh, type on chat, you can post your questions on chat, and once the uh, presentation is done, then we will get all those questions together and we will uh, ask our speakers. So continue to post your questions on chat window while the presentation is going on. And uh, I'll go ahead with the introductions. So uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Mr. John uh, Gibson. He's director of Avista's Innovation Lab and chief research and development engineer at Avista. Uh, uh, Mr. John Gibson leads a, a, the team that develops grid products and services for Avista's electric and natural gas customers. With more than 25 years of experience in the electric utility industry, Mr. Gibson is currently leading the development of a shared energy model called an eco district, which uses a centralized plant to supply energy to multiple buildings in an area referred to as five smartest blocks in Spokane, Washington. This innovative model could transform how the electric grid of the future operates and help reinvent the utility business model. Mr. Gibson holds a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical and civil engineering plus a master's in engineering management. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of Washington. So with that, I welcome uh, Mr. John Gibson to our talk today. Thank you so much for doing this. And I will uh, let you start your presentation. I thank, you, thank you, Anamika. I appreciate that and the opportunity to talk. I, I, I think I was stating at the beginning of this uh, presentation, the one thing I do miss is the fact that I can't drive down through the Palouse country in the fall and, and visit with all of you and have face-to-face -face conversation and, and you know, seek out an opportunity to learn from so many of you. So, um, but the one thing I would like to talk to you about today is Avista's uh, investment in a building called the Morris Center. And I think to help articulate what that is, I'm gonna go floor by floor of the different roles the utility will part um, plays in the Morris Center. And then I'm going to talk about some of the drivers that are um, pushing the utility into um, transforming itself and what function the lab will perform. And we really talk about it as kind of the gap between really all of your ideas, your vision for the future, and how do we incorporate that into our practice at the utility. And that to a large extent is what the lab is going to, the functions the lab is going to perform. And we call that mining the gap. You know, when, when I, prior to COVID, when I could travel around the country and visit with many of the bright people that are in this room or in this virtual room, um, people would always come up and say, you know, Avista seems to be fairly progressive and innovative. And what's in the DNA of Avista? What makes it do things more innovative than what a traditional utility might do. And my response is pretty consistent. And it's really about our community, the community of bright people that are located in our service territory. And it starts with what's occurring in Pullman and Moscow. We have down there two leading researchers in the power industry that are essentially driving transformation in our industry and are leading research in regards to architecture or algorithms or a variety of uh, cybersecurity initiatives and control frameworks that essentially inform us on how we should transform our industry. So if you look beyond that, we also have a manufacturing facility down in Pullman Schweitzer Engineering Laboratory, which has been a great partner to Avista and has got some of the leading thinkers in the community in regards to the power sector. And then if you go just a little bit east of us to the Tri-Cities, we have Pacific Northwest National Labs. And they're essentially driving forward a variety of technologies and co-simulation application frameworks that are essentially allowing us to see what the vision of the future of a distributed energy resource and distributed intelligence out on the grid might look like. And then when you come to Spokane, you have ITRON, who is headquartered up here, which is leading the way in regards to AMI technology. And they have this concept of the Riva platform that allows you to install various components of code out on the meter to help with decision making rather than bringing it back to a central office. And then we have organizations like ECOVA that are evolving the utility business model in regards to how billing should be done. 
So with that in mind, you know, Scott Morris, which was our um, CEO, is now um, uh, chief executor of the board had this vision of Spokane and what could, how could we leverage all of the bright people that are in this region and how do we build momentum around it to essentially develop this new green energy economy. And he, is, he expressed that intention with the development of this concept of the Morris Center. And I'll go into some of the particulars about that. But it's really a representation of Avisa's intention to embrace the new green economy and develop the capabilities in its resources to be a trusted energy advisor for its customers. And what we're finding is that although there's a lot of bright ideas out there, especially in the research industry, it's difficult at times to commercialize them or to put them into our work practices. In other words, we don't learn by just listening, we learn by doing. And so the lab is essentially going to help us facilitate that learning by doing so that we can extend the good ideas that are occurring in research to essentially work practices and standards within our industry and a knowledge base within our knowledge workers to be able to execute on some of these ideas. So that's what we're trying to achieve with the uh, innovation lab. So this is a photograph. In the forefront is the Morris Center. In the background is the Catalyst Building. And the Catalyst Building has received most of the attention of this development. The Catalyst Building is um, referred to as a cross-laminated timber building. And it's fabricated, it's fabricated by um, a manufacturing facility located in East Spokane. So they take the raw uh, lumber that comes in and essentially create this cross laminated timber structure that they can build that's more sustainable. In addition to being cross laminated timber, it is also a um, net zero carbon free development. So the 150,000 square feet of uh, development that's going in is essentially net zero carbon free. Over the year, over the, over the year it will consume zero energy. It consumes energy every day, but the net of its production will essentially reduce it to zero. And so what it represents is a new construct for the utility. It becomes a brand. It's a new type of relationship with a customer because that net zero carbon-free development will attract the kind of people and jobs into our community that we're interested in. If you look at a lot of the high tech industries that are occurring in Seattle and Portland, their sustainability goals are very high. If we, the utility, can work with a developer and a partner in this to build a, a, a first class office space that will attract those type of tenants, that does nothing but improve the customers or does nothing but to improve the condition of our customers. So on the first floor, as I mentioned, I'm gonna step floor by floor through the Morris Center. On the first floor is essentially an energy plant. So when you go to the Catalyst building, there is no HVAC system located in that building. The HVAC system is located on the first floor of the Morris Center. And that HVAC system essentially provides the conditioned environment to the Catalyst building. It provides the hot and chilled water to supply the Catalyst Building's conditioned environment. And with that in mind, it's scaled in a way that it can support up to four, four additional buildings. And as it does that, that economies of scales provides a certain type of capability that you wouldn't typically put in a single building HVAC system, predominantly in the area of thermal storage. But another thing that we're exploring with as a part of this Clean Energy Fund 3 project that we're doing called Grid Enabled and Efficient Buildings is the utility is making an investment in infrastructure too. Infrastructure that's behind the meter. In this instance, it's essentially, it's combining all of the solar generation, be it on the Moore Center, the Catalyst Building, or any building that participates in the Eco District to a common bus. And then it's installing electric storage as part of that common bus, as well as 
D, uh, as well as converters and inverters that are all interconnected on that DC system. But probably more importantly is a control framework. A control framework that's integrated not only to these electrical assets, but to the thermal storage assets. The building management system that runs the energy plant has various modes of operation. We are designing and deploying specific modes of operation that serve the purpose of the grid. So it's kind of an interesting concept in regards to the utility making an investment on the other side of the meter. So let's talk just for a minute about that business model because really you can't have transformation in our industry without there being transformation in the financial model. Simply because financial models drive behaviors and without transformation there, you won't see any of these other technology platforms or inverter-based technologies being deployed in a way that's beneficial to our customers. So as I'd mentioned, there are specific assets that are owned by the utility that are being deployed on that building site. And those are the Avista utility assets. You can't deploy assets from a utility to a developer without it having value to all of our customers. And the way that's being done is those assets are not, they're operated by Edo, but the utility determines the schedule and how those assets are dispatched. The Spokane Eco District One is a private entity that has invested in the other assets that are in that energy plant. And so there's a variety of internet and Edo is the operator. They simply operate those assets for the benefit of the tenants in the buildings, as well as benefits to the grid dependent on the schedule that the utility provides to them. So we're really talking about a new financial model. And if we give just a thought about this financial model for a second, if you look at Spokane Eco District 1 assets, the challenge is in order to fund developments, you have to draw investment. And investments require a certain rate of return and a certain efficiency of that return. When you install these assets in Spokane Eco District, they really don't become economically viable. In other words, provide a return on the investment until you get multiple buildings interconnected to them. So they're slow in regards to getting a rate of return, which is encumbers investment into this type of project. If we could do a thought experiment for just a minute, what we might consider is, could the utility own all of the assets? And if utility owned all of those assets, pretty soon the eco district starts to look like a station, a substation. So when we talk about the utility and its infrastructure, we use substations in a lot of different locations. One of them is just outside of our generation facilities and others to essentially provide the connectivity of um, our network as well as the um, as well as being a load cent a load center or a load or energy delivery to a load center. If you could take for just a minute and think about this station that exists in the eco district, you could think of it as a controllable load station. So we're talking about a kind of different construct, a controllable load. The thing that when talking to power supply, the thing they often say in regards to demand response programs are one, they're not material, they're not very large, and two, they're not dispatchable, they're not controllable. This provides the opportunity for them to be controllable. The challenge is if you have these assets owned by the utility, there has to be benefit to all customers participating in, in leveraging these assets. That investment is going to be recovered by all the customers. So what is the broader socialized benefit to the customer? And you really have to then look about a different type of service model being in place so that the development helps fund those assets, but it's a little bit more patient on the capital because of the investment that utility makes. So it's a new kind of economic model that's being looked at 
as an opportunity for controlling load and dispatching load to support um, um, the requirements of our system. The other thing on the second floor of the Morris Center is what we call our customer experience space. Today, if you go to a Vista, you walk into the, I imagine many of you have been to the headquarters in Spokane, but when you open the door on your left is a paying station where you can pay your bill. There's a security guard. There's a locked gate. And then there's a, what I call the bank of a Vista, the Vista Credit Union. And that's what essentially is the environment that's in place for our customers not very welcoming. On the second floor, what we're doing is installing this space called the customer experience space that most of our energy efficiency engineers will be working at. And they'll have a tool crib, a lighting lab, and a variety of other activities to help engage with our customers on the different types of systems that they can install and the different types of tools that they can apply to measure those outcomes. In addition, Avista wants to reach out to the A&E community, the architectural and engineering community, and provide training to them around energy efficiency, as well as building code industries. So this is a way to essentially embrace that concept. Also on the second floor will be an operations center, which is not included in any of these pictures, but that operations center is Edo. They will be looking down from the meter into the various buildings to ensure that the facilities are being maintained. But they will also have an opportunity to look back up the grid to see how the, how it, the systems that they have in place impact the grid. So for the first time, there's going to be this visibility downstream of the grid and upstream of the grid. On the third floor is Avista's innovation lab and digital experience environment, as well as a set of pods for collaboration. And what we see on the first time is this concept of putting together a real-time simulations tools that represent essentially the feeders that are sourcing this particular energy plant. This is our first plot project as well as the energy plant itself will be modeled in there to essentially help facilitate a variety of use cases to determine how this business model might evolve. In addition, we have the ability to interconnect to many of the devices on the first floor in the energy plant to help either calibrate or refine our modeling to help support a variety of initiatives. The other is around digital innovation. There are always significant challenges around data and sharing data, specifically around our researchers. We've talked about a variety of platforms like Pi and other technologies that take a significant amount of sophistication and a full-time manager of those technologies in order to be able to utilize them. Often researchers or national labs are not necessarily equipped for that. So we're working with this concept of an open source digital platform that would make the data of the utility more available to help facilitate our partnerships with research institutions, as well as national labs and commercial partners. And that data will not only reflect the systems data, but also the simulation uh, data that we're collecting as well. And then finally, we recognize that we have a lot of people interested in coming up and collaborating with us and we want to provide that collaboration space. In this, we have one rack that's located in our Vista Corp area, but we have a separate room that has multiple racks that we want to essentially partner with on a variety of projects. Because often, you know, as research is conducted, it's implemented and a paper is written and there's not necessarily any transfer to industry. We don't want to take all of the ideas, but some good ideas would be nice if we could get our hands on those concepts as well. And as we implement them, we learn, we transfer that information to our staff. So as I mentioned, there's several drivers that are moving forward in regards to our industry. I've already mentioned a few, 
and that's the bright people in our community, both at the universities and the industries that we have around energy. They're helping us transform into a new utility. But we also recognize those bright people have influence and they have influence on legislation and they influence the type of regulations that are brought forward to the utility as well. And one of them is this concept of the Clean Energy Transformation Act that's occurring in the state of Washington. It will have a significant impact into our industry and we wanna make sure that we embrace that, enable it and do it in the most cost-effective way that we can for our customers. So the challenge really that we see in front of us is what we call mine the gap. Really the gap between your ideas, all of your bright ideas in regards to how distributed energy resources, grid architecture, control frameworks and algorithms can all influence and operate things like microgrids in a variety of other technology platforms, how do we roll that into a set of work practices? You know, inherently, utilities are, are resourced by people that do repetitive tasks very efficiently. And why is that? Because we receive a return on our investment for installing new capital plant. We can build things. The challenge is once we build them, it's typically the same thing over and over again. When we in, introduce a new technology, a new inverter-based technology, we don't have the engineers that are trained on that. We don't have the technicians that are trained in that. We don't have the work rules around that, and we don't have our craft employees around that. Even the solar that we were installing on WSU's campus, south campus, on this, on, in the U district, on the north side of the U district, we called one of our relay techs and they simply said, we don't have training on that, we won't work with that. So we're contracting many of those services out. We have to gap, we have to fill that gap between these ideas of the future and how we do our work on a day-to-day -day basis. And we, to help kind of illustrate that, you know, our infrastructure and our work practices and rules, safety rules, are all around this model called a centralized power system. As we start to move forward, we recognize that, you know, the types of products and services are, and the level of participation wanted by our customers are radically changing. We also understand that the architecture and the topology of our networks have been designed on a one-way power system and that we'll have to consider new types of grid architecture to help create things maybe as wild as a resiliency zone. In addition, we recognize that there's a significant um, proliferation of networks out on our system. And those networks provide certain visibility out to the edge. And once you can look out to the edge, you start to ask the question, what problems can I solve at the edge? So rather than having this typical client server architecture, we're now talking about a new distributed architecture. Even though many of our legacy systems, some of them 20 years old, still operate on an old architecture, we have to essentially be able to reinvent ourselves there. And the challenge we have really with any, and it's across our industry and we're seeing it in the built environment too, is this concept of interoperability between platforms. Many of the applications that we have, you know, one tenth of the cost is the application and the other, the other um, percentage is associated with um, the interoperability. The integration is 10 times more expensive than the application. So that's a challenge to us and we have to develop an architecture. You know, each enterprise system we deploy has its own data model. We need some kind of common information model to essentially facilitate that interoperability. And we need to have a new architecture, communication architecture and protocol that's more published and subscribed. So all of those are new drivers in regards to being able to meet the needs of these distributed energy resources and distributed intelligence out on the system. But fundamentally, it still comes back to the regulatory models. Because if you don't change the financial framework, 
for the utility. It will continue to behave to optimize its existing financial framework. And so that's a big part of the exploration is how do we essentially reinvent the utility's business model? You know, we partner with many of you and have been involved in many projects with you. And we recognize already that within Avista's Innovation Lab, that the way we do capital projects at the utility will significantly change. Really what we did was we worked on trust that we would get a variety of technology platforms or new appliances to put out on the grid and trust it to work, plug it into the grid and see what would happen. And that's just fundamentally dangerous. And it's not helpful in regards to the development and growth of our employees. So we see the lab as an ability to enable a lot of those concepts. We have a lot of research initiatives we do with the that are led by the universities and we intend to participate in those in the future and continue to do that and develop and have additional engagement. The challenge that we have is that if the work is just simply research, it can't be capitalized. And it's always difficult to get utility personnel working on initiatives that are just strictly O&M. And research by definition is O&M. If we build an asset as a part of an initiative, research initiative, it now becomes a capital project. And that's why these clean energy fund projects have been so helpful and why we have this different level of engagement is simply because there's an asset that's going to be built and we have really the okay by the utility commission to build that asset and to experiment with it. Really, we have to think about that. And Department of Energy and many of the FOAs that they come out with, funding opportunities that they come out with, have a capital asset that needs to be built. So those types of projects and initiatives are very beneficial. And so we need to think as we sit down with the universities and our research partners, figure out which of these projects, you know, there will always be pure research and we understand that. But in some initiatives, it may benefit to get the level of engagement you've been asking from the utility by having a more capital base. I have the obligation that my resources work a certain percentage capital, it, uh, work on capital projects. If they don't, I hear about it. So I am always directing them towards those types of initiatives. So really for us to extend our relationship, figuring out how to do that will be helpful. The other is when traveling to a variety of conferences, I always run into venture capitalists that are asking, is this something the utility wants? Could we do this work and would you be willing to fund it? And what I often say is, well, what we can tell you is what, at what life cycle that particular technology is for the utility. Is it way in front of the utility or is it behind the utility or what would be required to integrate? So we see an opportunity to essentially partner with venture capitalists to do that kind of research. And we have a variety of other types of relationships that we think we can establish in the lab to help provide the funding. This is a nonprofit lab. The money made from this, if money is made from the Avista Innovation Lab, it goes back to the ratepayer. It goes back to the customer and it offsets their rates. So that's the, um, um, how this project is how this lab is being funded. It's not a profit center. So just within the last five years, we've been working with all of these partners that you see on here. And we recognize that um, they're essential for us to learn and grow and develop the framework. But it's not often, often it's not just the utility but rather the energy ecosystem that has to transform. It's, it's the suppliers of relays, for example. If we need interoperability to a Schweitzer RTAC and we look at some technology that requires a virtual machine to be sitting on there, ideally it'd be nice to be able to partner with them and figure out how we can do that so that it would interoperate with other devices, which often is in conflict to their business model of wanting to control the whole market. The reality is, you know, that 
the reality is no one vendor will control the market. It's going to be multiple vendors. But what's costly to the utility is the fact that those vendors and those products do not interoperate. We will always be driving towards some kind of framework, you know, like open FMB and open DSP initiatives to ensure that we have that interoperability. Otherwise, it's just too expensive and we're not at all agile when we have these um, technology debt sitting in our office. So that will always be a driver for us in partnerships. And those are the types of initiatives we would want to look at in the lab. And so anyway, these are the different types of strategic partners that we've worked with and we see opportunities of working with in the future and would love to be able to partner with all of you in those types of initiatives. So in summary, it, Avista has invested in the Morris Center, but it's really all of yours, Morris Center. It's representative of a utility showing intention to how do we essentially address the concept of a digital grid? How do we address the concept of distributed energy resources? How do we address the concept to be able to come up with new products and services for our customer? We're showing our intention with the Morris Center. And the reality is with any type of innovation and in research one does, you fail. And there's an old Japanese proverb that says you fall seven times and stand up eight. But that's okay, that's what we're intending to do is to keep advancing the industry forward and recognizing it's easier to fall in the lab than it is on the grid. And it will help accelerate our transformation into a new type of utility. And then finally, we can come up with all of the wonderful ideas out there, a whole list of different ideas. Until it becomes operationalized, it won't become a reality. And those processes are fairly embedded. And so we really look at Avista's Innovation Lab as an ability to bridge the bright ideas from all of you on this call to essentially the day-to-day -day workers that are required to work with this equipment out in the field during all kinds of conditions and to develop the skill set necessary to become the community's trusted energy advisor. What it does is it enables your industry. It doesn't encumber it because now you have an attentive listener. We now start to understand what you've been talking about. And we do that through the deployment of this lab. So if there's any questions, I'll stop there. Thank you, John. I think virtual claps, probably. Uh, okay, so we can move on to Q&A. Um, maybe let's take a couple of questions from the panel, from the panelists. And then I'll move on to audience questions. Uh, if someone is speaking, you are probably muted. I was going to go with the audience first, but. Sure, I can do that. Um, all right, so uh, uh, one interesting question is, what are the main issues faced by the utility with increased penetrations of inverter-based technology? What tools, methods is used by utility to address the issue? Good question. Um, well, I keep going back to um, the project we're doing with um, the WSU is participating in regards to the microgrid that we're deploying, as well as Schweitzer that we're deploying on WSU's campus in Spokane. And we were interested in trying to get, um, I, I believe it was Ashish from Schweitzer came up and was trying to essentially communicate to one of the uh, inverters of the solar system. And we, we had this concern that we would have to open it up, an electrical system that we would have to open up. But in the utility, the engineers are not in a position to do that. We have to reach out to the craft to be able to request them to open and to provide the safety guidelines to be, be able to work with that equipment in the field. So that's the restriction because it's a production system. 
And consequently, we call the relay shop and they said, well, we don't have any training. We've never worked on this technology. We've never implemented that. You're gonna to have to go find somebody else to essentially help you with that. Over time, we've been able to kind of convince a couple from the relay shop to at least observe the work that's being done. But that, that's an example. Now, once we move it into a lab environment, the engineers are now in a position to be able to work on that equipment, develop a variety of work practices and standards around that equipment, as well as a, a variety of training programs that could be implemented. So now rather when, when uh, facing a challenge, we essentially have the resources necessary to go out and implement that in the field and to be able to support and operate those assets in the field. So that's been a big hurdle for us and we're hoping uh, that the lab will be the tool to be able to essentially address that, that constraint. Okay, great. So the second question is, did Avista design the microgrid power systems from Morris Center in-house? No, no. So uh, the microgrid that, that we deployed was designed by Schweitzer and we hired their consulting services to do that. But I, the one thing I will say very positively about the consulting services at uh, Schweitzer and Ashish's leadership is he's been very modest and humble and a great um, servant leader on the project. He's allowed us to come to the lab to learn and participate with him and um, really has kind of walked with us in understanding this technology. So. It's that kind of partnership that we're looking towards, is that kind of collaborative effort where we're learning, because at some point we're gonna to have to operate these systems. And if we don't learn it, the technology won't sell. So that, that's that been a big bridge for us in regards to this particular project. Okay, thanks. So the next question is, how much energy does the battery energy storage store relative to building's power use? Uh, so within the eco district, the component that I talked about in regards to the utility side is a part of our clean energy fund three project and that the DC bus and the electric storage have not been installed yet. It's actually out on the street right now in an RFP and we're looking at integrators to come in, but roughly it's going to be around 500 kW. But the other thing that we have is um, thermal storage and we have eight we have three 8,000 gallon tanks that will hold either hot or chilled water. In addition, we have one tank that's not installed yet that will be installed. It's called a state change storage device that's equivalent to the other three. And we really, what we're interested in, there's a couple use cases that we're looking at. One use case we're looking at is essentially trying to optimize the utilization of the grid or to levelize the demand from this customer. And the other is this concept of uh, uh, it being a qualified facility under our rate tariff schedule 62. It's a PERPA agreement that allows them to make available energy, excess energy. So if they can follow their own load as closely as possible, they essentially offset their retail rate. So that's another use case that we're looking at to help optimize that benefit. But one kind of interesting point about that is the excess energy is sold to them, sold back to them, whatever the market price is. So if the market price at the mid C is um, really high, higher than seven cents, they'll want to push as much energy out as possible. And when the market price is below that three cents or becomes negative, they'll want to essentially consume as much energy as they can. So those are kind of interesting dynamics that they could help optimize around to see what that valuation is. And that's what we'll be looking at. Yeah, a related question then is that what type of energy storage uh, technologies are used in the microgrid? Yeah, it's a lithium ion is what lithium we're doing. Ion. Okay. And like I said, we're going out to the street and typically what you do is you don't uh, procure a particular um, uh, vendor on a battery, you procure it through an integrator and they have the products that the storage product that they'll integrate to. 
Okay. And then I think a related question is that uh, what IEEE IC standards are being used for designing microgrid? Uh, what compatibility is there? What is its significance? Okay, so is Ashish on the call today? <laughs> okay. So I can have I him was address. asking for him. He's, he's my boss, uh, but I don't think he's on the call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so um, I don't have that answer to that. Sure, uh, we can definitely get back to you on that. So uh, I think this is an interesting question. Uh, do the domestic loads get charged for reactive power by electric utility company for electric bill? Can you say that again? So are we charging the residential customers for reactive power usage? Reactive power. Reactive power. Oh, reactive. Sorry, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I saw a podcast uh, earlier this year about an operator, um, uh, her last name is Zimmerman, and she was a part of the REV program and now she's an operator in the Australian market. And the challenge that they had was that the solar was so prominent in Australia that the marginal cost of energy was going towards zero. And so the old idea that you could have a consumptive rate, in other words, if you consume more KWs, you would pay a higher bill, is going away because that value is approaching zero. And so really what they're looking at now is more things, and I use this term pretty broadly, power quality uh, elements to ensure that as a cost rather than a consumption. So no, we've never in, um, you know, in the United States had anything other than a KW charge for consumption. Now, there is a reactive charge on large commercial customers, and it's, but it's basically a threshold value. Okay, that is interesting to learn. So uh, I think uh, this question uh, is related. Will Avista plan to explore ancillary services with PV and energy storage, including virtual inertia? If yes, how exactly are we to explore these services without actual market in place in Washington? But I think the main question is that are, uh, what are the plans for uh, different grid services that can be explored through this uh, lab setup? Yeah, the idea that we're kind of kicking around kind of is around this eco district. We, if you, if you think about the station that serves the eco district, it's near capacity, it's called Third and Hatch. And that station has roughly nine feeders. And it, if the feeders align pretty closely to what we call neighborhoods in the Spokane area. And each neighborhood has a unique set of characteristics to it or demographics associated with it. So in some neighborhoods, you might think, well, what could we do to essentially help them? And they're renting a place, they have very inefficient buildings, and they're not gonna be interested in solar and storage just because that's a cost option for them. Maybe it's more focusing on rebuilding the building stock there. Another neighborhood that's fed from the same substation is, um, a hospital district. And the hospital district in this um, might be more interested in a resiliency program. So you would deploy a set of assets that might be aligned with the type of resiliency. Another neighborhood that's served from this third hand substation is a very wealthy part, very wealthy neighborhood. Now in that neighborhood, they might be interested in electric vehicle charging stations. They might be interested in solar storage components. So I think what you have to do is bring the types of programs that are relevant to the needs of those particular neighborhoods. Otherwise you're not communicating to them and not helping them. So I, I think what you'll see in the future is some type of program that's aligned to a specific customer need and often a, a kind of a nasty word that's used in the utility industry is this concept of virtual power plants. That's commonly used and utilities don't like it because everyone wants to net their load and generation 
and are not at all interested or concerned about the infrastructure infrastructure that's supplying that. But if you go to a particular station and identify the neighborhoods that are sourced from that station, you could start to design programs that could have an accumulative effect in offsetting, for example, maybe the demand on that station that meets the specific customer needs as well. So they might be kind of virtual power plants, but they're geographically confined to a particular source. And so those are new types of programs that we're at least discussing. Interesting. So I think a connected question is going to be how long uh, will it be until this type of system is for sale for regular customers? Or we can well, develop them on scale? I mean, these kind of technologies. Well, today, you know, the, the today, so when you say ordinary customers, I'm assuming like a residential customer like might want customer. to install solar. And today they can go in and install solar. So, so they, more, more like uh, living in a virtual power plant kind of community. Well, um, so that's what we're trying to do and develop in regards to the eco district. And it's fundamentally going to come down to that valuation. And, and as we look at those value valuations, we will reflect that back to the utility commission. You know, the utility commission is a part of that energy ecosystem. And, and what their concern is, they're put in a job that basically says to them, don't mess this up. You're in the Northwest, the energy costs are relatively low, don't mess this up. So they inherently, they don't want to make much adjustment, right? It's really the legislature and the residents of the state of Washington that are driving them towards change. They're the ones that are saying, we want sustainable, clean energy resources, and we want to make the utility 100% renewable. Well, those are going to put pressure points on the utility commission in regards to reevaluating that business model. And it, but in regards to the cost, they're constantly thinking, I don't want to be the person that messed up this cost model. That, that's a very curious argument that basically raises a question that I had that how do utility innovate in the in this kind of setup where you know we have a lot of prosumers the cost of consumption is going down but the challenges are increasing we have a lot of prosumers there is a lot of cybersecurity issue coming up how does you know utility balance it out in terms of research as well as in terms of providing uh, quality service supply while not raising the cost I think that's a very challenging problem for the utility companies to solve right Mm -hmm. And in light of that, often what we do is we look out to the community that's on this call, right, to help guide us and direct us to address many of these technical challenges. In regards to the regulatory model, the, they're being moved to a large extent by the legislation. It's their legislation that's going to drive those changes. In regards to the utility itself, there is no R&D budget. In our rates, there is no R&D budget. The clean energy, the clean energy funds essentially are the, the budget. For example, I mean, there are some R&D budgets. We have an R&D budget in Idaho that we support, that we work with the University of Idaho and other Idaho universities with, but it's relatively small r relative to the scale it should be. But we don't have that. So um, we are leveraging these clean uh, leveraging these funding from the state legislature to do these projects to experiment with it. And so that's what's driving the Seco district project. If that funding did not exist, we would be okay just delivering energy in a highly reliable fashion to you and wonder why you keep talking about renewable energy resources. Totally understand. Um, I think this is a curious question. Um, will eco district lead to less investment on basic infrastructures? Yeah. How much backup energy supply would be counted? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I'm glad that was asked. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion and debate around this concept of non-wire, right? And the reality is there's very few opportunities where a non-wire alternative is cost effective. Because the way a non-wire alternative is evaluated economically is it's the avoided cost of capital. So if I have a station that's located and I'm able to do some work to avoid upgrading that station for 10 years, 
it's really the growth of that money over 10 years that becomes the cost. So when you look at the eco district, third and hatched, even to replace that station and to add new feeders and to get new equipment, the avoided cost for some five to 10 years on that was $300,000. It's not even material relative to the needs of um, uh, what this development required. It's not even material. So that's why it needs a different type of economic model. It can't just be avoided cost of capital. If, if the utility commission wants us to do non-wire alternatives, and they seem to want that, they are putting legis uh, regulations out there to do that. I don't think we can go back to them and say, ha ha, we've determined there's no cost effective non-wire alternative. What we have to do is show them, look, here's the four or five projects we've done. Here's the valuation. And to make it economically viable, to make this eco district economically viable, we need to have a different type of financial model that allows the utility to get paid for services. Services not unlike how Edo is being operated, that the utility could get services to help, help get a recovery on a localized benefit. So that, that, that's the challenge, yeah. It's yeah. fun. <laughs> I can imagine. So um, I think uh, this question, um, uh, maybe if you can highlight a little bit, how can the students um, get access to lab or resources for training and research purpose, some ongoing uh, project or some ongoing activities? Uh, that's kind of one of the final questions that uh, I think from the audience list. Well, the first thing I would say in regards to that is one, you are all welcome to come visit and we can set up social distancing and we can all wear a mask and come through here and see this facility and we'd love to share it with you. In addition, we're interested in your ideas and your guidance on the different activities we can do. But in regards to um, um, what, what it might look like in the future, we really want to leverage universities and the research talent that exists at these universities to help transform our industry, but not just do it in a sense to achieve the outcome the university may be interested in, and that is either funding a graduate student, I mean, not just solely to funding a graduate student or publishing a paper. We want to essentially help it align with the strategy on how we're going to change our industry and we want to be able to enable uh, enable that as an operational characteristic or an operational work practice that's necessary. And we think our lab can do that, help help with that. Yep. So I think one follow up question from the students is, how do we set up a visit? <laughs> <laughs> well, you give me a call, and so I'll leave my contact information. I'd be more than happy to have any student come up. That is excellent. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for audience for all the interesting questions and conversations. Thank you so much, John, for your patience and answering every question in detail for us. Um, do we have any questions from panelists? Well, first, I've got one suggestion for John. If you want to share your contact information, if you put it in the chat and have it go to the panelists and attendees, that will go to everybody on the call. Okay. Thank okay. you. Do I have a chat window? Uh, yeah, I, I, bottom. Probably no, I just have mute and video on the bottom. Okay. Oh, here, oh, here's question and answers and chat. Okay, here we go. Okay, great. There's a pull down menu under the chat where you can choose who it goes to. I'll just do all participants. Yeah. I'll leave my phone number in there and then I'll put my email as well. That would be great. Okay, yes. We got your email and phone number. I think I will share it with the attendees. This is shared only with panelists.
No, it says all panelists and attendees, right? No? Oh. No, all no. Oh, all panelists. I'm sorry. Okay, I think it's shared with everyone now. Is it? Okay. Yep. Okay. So I, uh, we have uh, another uh, upcoming event. It's the same series, the microgrid webinar series. Uh, uh, the Dr. Uh, Anrik Sylvester from Wazoo is is giving the the next event, and it's about microgrid as a resilience resource in the distribution system. Uh, so. Uh, I posted the information on the chat if you would like to check it out. Uh, it sounds an uh, interesting topic. Okay. So uh, do we have any final uh, questions, comments, discussion point before we hang up for the evening? Well, I, I have a short question. Uh, when is the, uh, your uh, simulation lab and things are supposed to be up and running? So we're configuring it right now. We have all the equipment, we procured it, we brought it into the lab and we've started assembling it on the racks right now. And so I think we're probably probably four to six weeks away from getting it all set up and running. So that's probably in light of that and probably be best to come up when we actually have the simulation up and running. Yeah. If you want to visit it. Yeah. I could. Spring sometime, next spring sometime. Is yeah, probably because of weather. Yeah. I was told we would have a vaccine by election day. <laughs> well, Which election? The, yeah, the, maybe by election results. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, everyone. It's great visiting with all of you. I wish we could do this in a live setting and I always find these platforms a little awkward for me, but, um, but no, thank th you. Th thanks so much for taking the time for talking yeah. to us in the evening. And uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and uh, have a great evening. And uh, thank you so much. We look forward to visiting the lab. Yeah, let's do work together, everyone. That'd be fun. Yes, <laughs> bye. Bye, All right. bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.